It's great to be here. I'm thrilled to be in front of a, a home crowd, I guess you could say, a Vermont audience. And I will share my screen. And so hopefully you're seeing my screen, which says the title of this talk, The Zone is Us, Sacrifice in the Space-Time of Climate Change. Uh, the Anthropocene is less a time than it is a zone, a space-time encircling the central event of impending climate change, accompanied by species extinctions, population movements, and other turbulence. Like the gale force winds that build into a spiraling hurricane, this stormy zone encircles an eye that can hardly be faced directly, that of climate trauma, a foreknowledge that what awaits many of us and what's already here for some of us is a traumatic loss of bearings in the world. This zone is a layered and mysterious place and how we engage with its layers will dictate how we might navigate through it. Gleaning from ancient Greek mythology, I propose three parallel and com complementary paths for navigating this relationship. Those of chronos or causal determination, a space for science and the measurement of progress through the zone, of ion or imaginative constitution, a space for the arts and humanities, and of kairos, entailing the leap into action without guarantees. I start with a few epigraphs that you can read to yourselves. We begin with the Anthropocene, the proposed geological epoch in which we have begun living or into which we are moving. The Anthropocene narrative should by now be somewhat familiar. Its four proposed variations date it back either to the beginnings of widespread agriculture, deforestation, rice cultivation, and stock raising, the demographic collapse across the Americas resulting from the encounter of Eurasian biocultural invaders, humans, animals, plants, germs, viruses, and the indigenous biocultures of these continents, which resulted in rapid reforestation dramatically subsuming carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, or the two better known variants, the steam engine and the onset of the industrial revolution and the great acceleration of the mid 20th century with its atom bomb tests, petrochemicals, fertilizers, plastics, refrigerants, pesticides and herbicides, and other novel and often toxic substances that have by now spread into every ecosystem on the planet. Anthropocenic time is first and foremost empirical, scientific time gathered from observations indicating things seen, data collected, observations that together yield a result, that there's been a noticeable shift, the passing of a set of markers, and so we'll give it a name, call it X. There's two parts to this. Measurement, anthropocenic time is clock time, always counting, dating, punctuating, time that is apportioned and always passing, the second part is causality. Scientific time is the time of cause and effect. It's always determining, it comes to us already determined, and it's our task to read the signs and note them down. Here's what's happened. Without scientific study, we wouldn't know the first thing about climate change. And the good thing is that if there's cause and effect, then we can try this and watch what happens. We can tinker. Clock time is meaningless time, every second like the next. Yet it also feels as if it's always emptying, 
we're operating here under the sign of Kronos, measured time, which also happens to be the time of Saturn, time that gets old, that gets replaced. We can even count the seconds left. This is the time that finds us constantly pursued by our own demise. We will, after all, become one more layer of sleepy time on a many layered planet. The second kind of time is that of Ion, God of eternal and cyclical time, the time that always returns. This is the time that can be recognized and turned into meaning. The time of the story, the story of time, time anchored in the heavens. Ionic time is organic and meaningful, the time of comings and goings, the time that situates us between our roots in the earth and the stars in the heavens. Ion takes the measure of our time and installs it within the sacred time of eternity. This is the time of our world historical significance as told by tellers of tales and singers of refrains. What is the meaning of the time we are considering here? The Anthropocene, rightly considered as a minor block of time in earth history, is nevertheless a sort of achievement, an event worth heralding. But is it a blessed one or a cursed one? We assign meaning to decades, to generations, to epochs and eras. Anyone old enough here to remember the age of Aquarius? Or the end of the world? The Anthropocene offers multiple possibilities for storytelling. There's the good one, the fabulous one, the bad, ugly, and bloody one, the misanthropocene. The term has been critiqued for its bluntness, being a very blunt tool for understanding a very complex set of processes. Anthropocene suggests that all of humanity shares responsibility for this epoch, when in fact it's only a single variant of humanity, modern industrial capitalism, that's been responsible for both of the main markers for the beginning of the Anthropocene, the Industrial Revolution and the Great Acceleration. So other names have been proposed to better identify the cause, the Capitalocene, the Manthropocene, the Plantationocene, hearkening to European colonialism's penchant for turning the world into a plantation, and so on. And some questioning of the naming process may be warranted as well. Another pitfall of considering it our current epoch is that this suggests that humans will be around for that epoch, but all it means is that human activities will have started it. They will have been responsible for the geological marker it leaves behind. We have no idea where it will go or who or what will come with it. The Anthropocene is, in this sense, what Peter Brannan, Earl Ellis, and others have called an event. If the Anthropocene is a triggering event, then what follows it is yet to be determined. But if meaning is what we're looking for, should we not be seeking meanings that could draw us forward, not just to an unlikely good Anthropocene, but to something both more realistic and at the same time more visionary? Is another world possible? Cultural theorist Donna Haraway has proposed a Cthulhu scene from the word chthonic, meaning earthly. Australian eco-philosopher Glenn Albrecht has proposed the symbiocene, an era marked by symbiotic and mutually enhancing relationships encompassing humans in multi-species ecological communities. Catholic eco-theologian Thomas Berry has proposed the ecozoic, an era, not a mere epoch, which for geologists is a big difference. 
and Barry, the theologian, calls himself a geologian. Others, including China's Xi Jinping, speak at least of an ecological civilization, though as yet not many deeds have followed the words. If Anthropocene is what we have, then we still have to determine what it means to us. Literature provides some options for that. Mary Shelley's Frankenstein is one option. But unlike Frankenstein's creation, climate change was unintentional and unexpected. In this sense, it's more like an encounter with an alien, something unexpected, unwanted, mysterious, at least initially, and at the same time vast, or what eco-philosopher Timothy Morton calls massively distributed. Unlike any alien, however, climate change gives us an option of recognizing this alien as our alien, our child. At the same time, it raises questions about exactly whose child it is and whose it isn't, and about who is child and who is parent. So what can be helpful for us is to find an analogy with something else that's unexpected, mysterious, at least initially, massively distributed, and with variable options for ownership, affiliation, and distance. Stanislav Lem's 1962 novel Solaris is about the human encounter with a planet covered in an ocean of gelatinous plasma, which appears to act as if it were sentient. Earth scientists attempt to interpret its actions and to communicate with it, but are unable to find any consensus on what the actions mean. Much of the book describes the various epistemological, scientific, philosophical, and cognitive efforts to make sense of this entity, this new being on the horizon of humanity. Lem wrote that the peculiarity of Solaris's activities seems to suggest that we observe a kind of rational activity, but the meaning of this seemingly rational activity of the Solarian ocean is beyond the reach of human beings. But Solaris is active, not passive, and among its own actions is to create materializations from its human visitors' memories. These materializations are traumatic and psychologically consuming. They become objectified ghosts from the Solarian visitors' own pasts that come back to haunt them, and that they must learn to somehow live with and account for. It's this moral dilemma that Tarkovsky emphasized in his cinematic adaptation of the novel and that I wish to emphasize today. As Slavoj Žižek writes about the film, the planet Solaris has the magic ability to directly realize your deepest traumas, dreams, fears, and desires, the innermost of your inner space. In all of this, the story serves as a metaphor for anything that is larger than us, that we are confronting for the first time, and that doesn't bring with it a self-evident instruction manual. Its significance is, in some sense, undecidable without asking about the significance of us who encounter it. Such a thing is anthropogenically induced climate change and its carrier, the Anthropocene. How we deal with it is very much a factor of how we make sense of it, as our creation, our Frankenstein mo monster, our alien, our child, our planet, even as it raises questions about who we are and thereby becomes our distorting mirror. But what's at the center of this event on our horizon? What traumatic kernel can be found at the eye of this growing hurricane. This is what brings us to the third kind of time, one that requires squarely facing the situation. The third kind of time is the time of kairos, the time of possibility within impossibility, the timeliness of the open moment, discontinuous, ruptured, kairotic time is open time, the time of responsive action without guarantee, 
This is the moment in which we act in response to what we see in action that amounts to a leap of faith. At this point, I, I wanna step back to say a little about what's behind my three approaches to time. It's not Greek mythology, it's actually the semiotic philosophy of Charles Sanders Peirce, often recognized as this country's most important philosopher. And specifically, his phenomenology of categories, according to which everything in the world can be distinguished between its qualitative firstness, as he called it, the secondness of actual events and relations, and the thirdness by which those events are mediated and made sense of, in other words, the world of meanings and generalizations. In this sense, our first approach, which I've called chronos, comes second on the spectrum of possibility. Secondness involves the direct causal relationship between two things, or causal determination, which is the basis of scientific understanding, the study of what actually is. Our second approach, ion, corresponds to Peirce's thirdness, which involves interpretation and ultimately semiosis, the creation of meaning. And so it amounts to the freedom of an interpreter to make sense of a given relation or situation. Thirdness is how we make sense, but also the fact that we can make different kinds of sense, different meanings from the same empirical datum. The semiotic universe is an open one, allowing for a change in direction based on the sense made of things. The one that remains and which really comes first, but which I've left for last, is what Peirce calls firstness, which is more primordial. It's the quality of a thing, anything, in and of itself before it is known, measured, or interacted with in any way. It corresponds to the feeling of that thing. Before we can respond, we have to feel. That's where the remainder of this talk will go. The quality of a thing, especially a new thing, is like the first image of a black hole. This image of a black hole was released in 2019 and named by astronomers Pauehi, Hawaiian for the adorned fathomless dark creation. Entering the black hole of a new phenomenon, a new situation requires a method that is sensitive to the quality of feeling surrounding that thing. It's only by opening up to that quality that we can begin to adequately respond to it. What is the quality of feeling surrounding the Anthropocene and the climate change that is its central feature? This may be something new on the human horizon, but it's something we are entering into at various rates with unclear boundary and transition markers. I propose that we give it the murkier name of a zone how we respond to that zone that opens up before us and how we choose to make sense of it is the central question for humanity. In the Strugatsky brothers' novella, Roadside Picnic, the basis for Tarkovsky's later film, Stalker, the zone, or rather a series of zones, was created by alien visitors who are never seen we just have to deal with the impacts of what they've left behind. In Tarkovsky's film adaptation, the impacts create a zone of mystery which elicits apocalyptic anxieties, but also hopes, sometimes mundane hopes and sometimes millenarian ones. It's this mixture of anxiety, risk, mystery, and vague hope that comes to us in the zone of anthropocenic climate change. The film Stalker became a template for Soviet citizens interpreting the zone of exclusion or estrangement created in the wake of the Chernobyl nuclear accident. And it is this resonance that stays with us today in the creation of zones of estrangement, those zones created in the wake of today's technological and climate-induced disasters. A number of writers have written about the eco-anxiety, ecological grief, environmental melancholia, and eco-sickness 
associated with climate change, mass species extinction, and the like. Five years ago, Ian Kaplan first articulated climate trauma as a form of pre-traumatic stress syndrome, an immobilizing anticipatory anxiety about the future. The American Psychological Association a few years ago published a booklet entitled Mental Health and Our Changing Climate, which should probably be required reading for anyone teaching or mentoring young people today, or any parent for that matter. Jiwa Woodbury writes, climate trauma is an ever-present existential threat with a bevy of constant cognitive reminders, melting ice caps, eroding shorelines, waves of homeless refugees, the ravaging storms, floods, and fires broadcast into our homes 24-7, and the constant roll call of disappearing species, vanishing rainforests, and dying coral reefs. We're talking here about suffering that's already happened, that is happening, and that will continue to happen as things get worse, which we know from scientific projections they will. When suffering is pre-planned, when it's part of the calculus of risks and purported benefits of certain activities, then it is a form of sacrifice. If the Anthropocene is defined by fossil fuel civilization, then we need to recognize that this civilization has been the most productive and at the same time most destructive in, his, in history. It has produced enormous abundance at the sacrificial cost of health risks, large-scale disruption of ecosystems, and now a globally changing climate with potentially suicidal risks to humans and to nature. Risks that are unequally distributed across the cultural and ecological fabric of the world. This map shows historical carbon consumption per nation per capita and compared that with projected carbon vulnerability per nation. I'll show that to you again so you can watch the balloons blow up and get smaller. Here's another map of the geography of disaster victimhood from a six month period in 2019. And in 2020, and these are only internally displaced persons, but we see that the United States is not immune. The risk today, as Australian eco-philosopher Glenn Albrecht puts it, is of an unraveling of the established patterns and regularities of Holocene phenology, followed by a new abnormal, characterized by uncertainty, unpredictability, genuine chaos, and relentless change, earth distress, human distress. What awaits us in the coming decades is in fact the largest explosion of human suffering this planet has seen, an explosion to which the COVID-19 pandemic is barely a premonition, a quiet precursor. In this sense, the zone may not be a zone separated from us, such as the 30 kilometer exclusion zone around a place like Chernobyl, or the recently rebuilt sarcophagus that protects us from disaster and spills. It is more the other way around. The zone is us, humans transforming the surface of the earth on a scale that's geological. Or flipped around, the zone of comfort we are leaving is the Holocene, the bubble of reality or safety zone that has been shaped around human activities over the last 12,000 years, which in fact provided the conditions for everything we know as civilization and which we today know are at extremely high risk of being destabilized. The emotional space-time of climate trauma consists of zones that are entered at different rates depending on our positioning. There is the pre-traumatic zone, 
for those who have managed to shelter themselves so far, the becoming traumatic zone for those who face loss of shelter and bearings in a readily imaginable, almost here future, the already traumatized zone for refugees seeking shelter from wildfires, droughts, hurricanes, rising seas, and wars over land, water, and other climate affected conditions, and the continuously traumatized continuously post-traumatic zone where we find indigenous and colonized populations for whom climate change is continuous with centuries of world destroying identity rupturing trauma. These layers are interdependent and how we engage with them will dictate how successfully we might navigate through the zone, assuming there is a beyond to it. The paradigm case in trauma studies is the Holocaust, which Shoshana Fellman and Dory Laub consider an event without witness, not just because the perpetrators destroyed much of the evidence of what they did, but because the victims had no appropriate frame of reference to account for it at the time. Ecological trauma is about the witnessing of a catastrophe that has not yet occurred, or that has occurred in isolated instances of a broader, slower, and more cataclysmic unfolding that may or may not ever transpire in its complete form. Eco-catastrophe is a trauma whose perpetrators and victims are ill-defined and whose nature is often delayed, mediatized, spread via images and narratives rather than from direct experience. Awareness of the possibility of ecological collapse doesn't hit you like an oncoming car. Such awareness gathers slowly, accumulating evidence like clouds rolling in the background of our consciousness until something tips us over the edge, taking us out of the familiar phase space of the everyday into a less familiar place, one of utter insecurity and vulnerability. So on to the second segment of part three, the final part of this talk. If we begin to act by registering the quality of feeling surrounding the molten core, the eye of the hurricane, the black hole at the center of Anthropocenic climate change, then where do we go from there? First, we should ask, what are we capable of? Who we? Is there a we that can act as a unified collective agent? in a world that's divided, not just by nations, religions, faiths, and suspicions of various kinds, but increasingly within nations whose divisions are stoked by the technological agents we allow to monetize our divisions. And just as an aside, we should be paying attention to the hearings around Facebook and Instagram. They represent the closest thing our divided Congress has been able to muster in the direction of collaboration on an incredibly important issue, which is taming the Wild West of what Shoshana Zuboff has aptly named surveillance capitalism. To navigate the mysterious zone into which we descend, will require an exercise of creativity unlike any we have seen before. Creativity learned from patterns and practices found in the world around us, some of them observed and known by longstanding cultures, others of them gleaned through new tools of measurement and observation, all of them explored with the humble curiosity of someone descending onto a new planet and eager to learn the rules of respectful engagement that have evolved over periods longer than the brief interlude of the Holocene. One start toward a symbiocene would be to begin with creative ecologically appropriate reparations and restorations of that which is lost, buried rivers, drained wetlands, disappearing prairie grasslands, forests, and other ecologically significant landforms. Lost and disempowered eco-social communities, which can still be creatively re-indigenized. And I show the image at the top as a reminder that our own land grant university for which I work is founded on a theft of land, which has yet to be publicly acknowledged or repaired. 
you could read about that in High Country News, their investigation from last year. Leached coral reefs and other ecosystemic impairments for which we can replace novel ecologically appropriate formations. I've been showing you the work of ecological artist and sculptor Jason DeCare Taylor, whose works displayed at the bottom of the ocean suggest a humanity beneath the waves of a changing climate, a humanity sleepwalking toward disaster, beset by uncertainty and resignation, caught on life rafts and sunk beneath the waves, but also a humanity willing to give itself to become the coral basis for new ocean life. Taylor's underwater sculptures composed of pH neutral materials double as artificial reefs intended to sustain and proliferate the life of the organisms that are losing their habitus as humans reduce coral reefs dramatically around the planet. They are therefore an instance of human art collaborating with non-human art, art in the sense of practical skill, whether that be the skill of creative reappropriation of objects or the skill that it takes to root in and grow on such objects. Any desirable form of human coexistence with the earth will in the future require experimental forms of mutual accommodation and collaboration between and across disciplines, communities, and species. This work called Vicissitudes is located off the coast of Grenada, an island of which the vast majority of inhabitants are descended from slaves taken against their will from West Africa and brought across the Atlantic. Some of them died on the way, some were thrown off the slave ships and buried beneath the ocean, some survived. David Carazza writes that, by creating a work of art which literally becomes part of a living thing, the coral reef, Taylor taps into a rich thematic vein for thinking about the slave trade. He takes figures that in one sense represent death and turns them into the medium for new life with the process that enacts violence on their bodies, producing an afterlife in vibrant color. The irony is that Taylor, a white British artist, did not intend this meaning, but it took it on in its own afterlife as it interacted with cultures of interpretation and layers of time, historical and geological layers, resonant with the middle passage of slaves from Africa to the Americas. I wanna suggest that it is another middle passage, a reverse passage out of colonial slavery toward a different future that global culture may need to undertake. This work called Anthropocene off the coast of Mexico depicts the decomposing carcass of industrial civilization in one of its most personal, even likable forms, the Volkswagen Beetle. It's the spirit of squeezing a multi-species afterlife from the decomposing body of the Anthropocene that is required for a future culture of the post-Anthropocene, the symbiocene. I will end with a few quotes from African philosopher Achille Mbembe, who last year in the midst of the COVID pandemic and the George Floyd protests, wrote of the universal right to breathe. COVID, he wrote, has exposed the extent to which we humans are not the only inhabitants of the earth, nor are we set above other beings. We are crisscrossed by fundamental interactions with microbes and viruses and all sorts of vegetal, mineral, and organic forces. More accurately, we're, part of, we're partly composed of these other beings, but they also decompose and recompose us. They make and unmake us, starting with our bodies, our environments, and our ways of living and dying. If indeed COVID-19 is the spectacular expression of the planetary impasse in which humanity finds itself today, then it's a matter of no less than reconstructing a habitable earth to give all of us the breath of life. Humankind and biosphere are one. Are we capable of rediscovering that each of us belongs to the same species, that we have an indivisible bond with all life. 
This brings me back to the quote I cited earlier of creation being a creation of time. Mbembe is referring here to Martinican philosopher and psychiatrist Franz Fanon's notion that colonization involves a negation of time. From the colonial point of view, natives were not simply people without a past and without history. They were people radically located outside of time. Europe had the monopoly on that essential human quality we call the disposition toward the future. So the colonial framework of predetermination, decolonization opposed the framework of possibility, the possibility of a different type of being, a different type of time, a different type of creation, different forms of life, a different humanity, the possibility of reconstituting the human after humanism's complicity with colonial racism. In an eco-cultural perspective, this applies not only to colonized peoples, but to a colonized earth, to a colonialism applied at the scale of the earth to life itself, an earth conceived as without time, on which humanity, the Anthropos, imposes its time, its space, its agency. It turns out, however, that earth does have its own time, many times, some of them extending far beyond the human in both directions to the deep past and to the unknowable future. In some of these earthly times, humans constitute a mere episode. Decolonizing in this sense requires finding new and different forms of life in which the earth itself, a living earth with its own time and its own possibilities, intermingle with a humanity rendered open to multiple futurities and multiple ancestralities, all of them mixed with many non-humans in changing relationships, contracts, alliances, and formations. Mbembe writes, if we must together walk anew the paths of humanity in companionship with all species, then it is perhaps necessary to begin by recognizing that at bottom, there is no world or place where we are totally at home, masters of the premises. What is proper always arises at the same time as what is foreign. The task ahead is to find ourselves among the multitudes of a world that is not our own and certainly not ours to own, but that calls upon us to join it, to recognize it, to discover its difference from us. A world or rather a zone that is full of its own kind of life that opens out to the world's foreignness, a foreignness we can never fully see understand, encompass, or even imagine. To create the future is to create a time that is no longer ours, that has never been ours, a time to which we might nevertheless contribute if we give of ourselves to it. If the zone we are moving into is a break from the immunological safe space of the Holocene, if the Anthropocene event is the signpost marking our exit from the comforts of a civilization harboring Holocene and a re-entry into a wilder, untamable, and unknowable earth, then we can start by recognizing the discomfort and anxiety it brings. Returning to a dynamic earth is frightening. To survive in this zone, we cannot proceed unchanged, hiding behind gates and walls of economic, ethno-nationalist, religious, or other identity barriers. We can only move forward knowing we must remake and refind ourselves together in experiments of multi-species futurity that are hardly imaginable from where we are today. There are those among us who've already passed through the layers of this zone indigenous colonized enslaved peoples and others, some of whom have come out the other end and whose voices we ought to hear as we try to make our ways forward. Or else we can, as Pedro Marzorati suggests, continue marching blindly forward in our somnolent colonial arrogance and go down with the tide. That is the choice before us. I promised my wife I would end on an optimistic note. So I turned to Bobby McFerrin to cheer us up. 
and I'll roll the credits in a moment. There it goes. song I wrote you might want to sing it note for note don't worry be happy all right you probably know the rest of the song so I'll fade it out and pause it there thank you very much the first question in the chat is are there other cultures or countries that you believe are more advanced on this path towards a new openness a dynamic earth than is the US what are the commonalities of those cultures? Um, hmm. Well, I'm not sure. I don't think that's a very straightforward question for me to answer because I think, you know, we have to, we have to be on this path together collectively. We've never had a global society that actually acted uh, collectively as a single unit, and we're still figuring out how to do that. We're still developing institutions to do that. Uh, there are certainly cultures that have been around for, for many centuries that have lived in relationship to their local environments in relatively sustainable ways. So there are things we can learn from those examples, but... Um, but we can't learn everything from them because I think the situation is new. The situation is global. Uh, as I tried to uh, get across, it's it, it's not something that we expected and anticipated. Uh, a couple of hundred years ago, when people started burning fossil fuels, we didn't think we'd change uh, the atmosphere. So, so this is a situation that we're all learning about collectively, uh, even though I think my the core of what I was trying to get at is that there's an experience at the center of what's coming, which is a traumatic kind of experience. And there are people and cultures that have gone through variations of that already by virtue of being colonized, of losing their land, of losing their language, of being of having their families uh, broken up and and we, we know the histories of indigenous cultures in settler countries like ours. Uh, so there are many things to be learned from many people, many cultures, uh, countries perhaps, but uh, it's something that, um, that I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that there's anyone that's more advanced. There are countries that are better set up to, to move in the right direction. Um, the U.S. with its incredible political polarization is, is um, almost incapable of doing anything at this point until we solve that polarization, which is why I brought up the media. That's, that's a big deal, I think, in our country. Other countries are smaller and they're more capable to do things. So countries in Europe and perhaps elsewhere. Uh, professor, I, it was... Uh, very noticeable to me as I've been participating in conference sessions over uh, over the last two or three weeks, um, that this conversation about climate change seems inextricably linked to uh, to race and racism in many ways, and and that came up clearly in your slides about um, energy use and the and the um, the way that rich countries are using much more energy than poor countries. And I, I wonder if you could reflect a little bit about that, that intersectional connection between the work that you're doing um, around climate change um, and the work that communities are doing around ending racism. Sure. Um, Bill McKibben mentioned something yesterday, which is that there's a kind of, I forget what he called it, iron law of climate change or something like that, that those who are least responsible for it will be most affected by it. And the reason for that is pretty simple. It's those who have been, who've benefited from 
the energy usage and the, the other processes that have created the problem of climate change, as well as mass extinction and the other kind of interlinked issues um, are the ones, you know, some of us have benefited most from that, others have not. And they would love to catch up on the uh, standard of, of living scale. And um, that's, that's something that we can entirely understand. But at the same time, if we're to deal with this issue, then um, it sort of makes ethical and moral sense that those who have been most responsible should bear the brunt of responsibility for, for um, the transition that I think we're acknowledging needs to happen. Um, race plays into that um, in some ways directly, in some ways indirectly, but certainly, um, you know, historically, it's pretty obvious that um, the kinds of processes that, that I've been describing have been connected to colonization, which has been connected to slavery of uh, millions of people and to systems of enslavement and plantation economies and other sorts of things. And then with, particularly in the Americas, the, um, the clash that I mentioned between Eurasian invaders and the populations that were here, and then the practical wiping out of indigenous populations and, and the long history of, of, of politically and socially and in other ways, continuing to do that. All of that is a matter of, of, of reckoning that hasn't yet quite happened. So, so those things are all linked in my mind. And mm -hmm. if you understand the historical uh, causes, then you understand those links. But it's also easy to see why people today would say, well, I'm not responsible if I'm you know, living in West Virginia and we've had coal jobs and now you're taking our jobs away from us. So these are very complicated issues. Uh, looking at Washington today where Bernie Sanders and Joe Manchin are, are trying to figure something out together, uh, it's pretty complicated and it requires a lot of listening which is a skill that uh, we're not so great at, listening to each other. I think several of the speakers so far in the conference have talked about that in particular, that skill of, of being able to listen to each other that um, is so sadly lacking in so, so many of our institutions right now. Uh, you know, the, the phrase that really jumped out at me from, uh, from your talk was pre-planned suffering as a form of sacrifice. Um, and uh, that I think will stick with me for a long time. Uh, but, but also, you know, the, the metaphor or, and the actuality of pre-traumatic stress disorder is, uh, is one that I think is very applicable even at the local level uh, that we find people who are both pre-traumatic that are becoming traumatized, that are already traumatized or that have been continuously traumatized through many generations of their family. Um, I think about that in particular in some of the conversations we have with our Abenaki um, brothers and sisters here in Vermont um, who are part of that continuously traumatized population. Uh, but you can really see that right here in Vermont. And I, I wonder if you could speak to that a little bit uh, of how you see this playing out at the local level and, and, and maybe what, what can we do to help um, mitigate or repair that harm? Yeah, good question. Um, I mean, Vermont is, is diverse, as we all know. It's not, um, you know, on the national scale, it appears to be a liberal state that's doing well with the pandemic and so on. But, but we know here that there are many kinds of people with many... Um, ultimately with traumas of their own. And in order to arrive at a better understanding of each other, we need to allow for an expression of some of that. Uh, so clearly there are communities, the Abenaki community and, and others that, that have borne a, the brunt of a lot of, you know, long history of of traumatization. There are others who are feeling traumatized. Uh, there are economic, economically um, 
maybe trauma is a strong word, I don't know, but uh, you could say economically traumatized communities, uh, generation, multi-generational sort of um, families and, and households. And they all require a little space to be able to face their own traumas before they can be expected to hear out other people's. And, and so I would come back to uh, the, the need to listen and to, uh, to talk to each other. And it's something that, you know, I've been following the debates over wildlife and, and uh, hunting in seven days, which maybe people have been reading. Uh, it's interesting to see how media has played a role, I think, uh, Paula Rutley or, or an editorial article in seven days talked about this, how Facebook has been an, a kind of actor on the side and how, how social media have, have been shaping the ways in which we talk to each other. So, so I, I would just come back to the need to uh, have conversations and listen to others so that their own various forms of trauma can be worked out in order for us to collectively engage in this in this massive massively distributed kind of you know pre-traumatic situation that we're all facing and most people a lot of people in the country don't want to even talk about it don't believe in it because they haven't been heard by the other side as they perceive it yeah. Thank you so much for, for um, uh, presenting us with so uh, many examples of media uh, and literature that we can look to for, for understanding and illumination. I just want to let folks know that we'll get that book list from, from Professor Iva Keefe and, and put it on the conference page so that people can find those books and those films uh, afterwards. Um, I, have, I have one more question that's been sent through a direct message and then um, we'll probably wrap it up with a, with a question about the underwater art, uh, which you use so effectively in the presentation. Um, but the, the question that came via a direct message is you, you mentioned the possibility of reparations for that which is lost um, in regards to natural habitats. And have you encountered examples of such reparations in your, in your research and, and studies? Um, hmm. Well, it kind of depends on how you define reparations. Um, I'm using the word fairly loosely because I'm, I'm trying to capture a lot with it. And I, I don't mean um, necessarily financial reparations or anything like that. I mean, just paying attention to, to what has been lost and trying to... Um, make amends for it in some way. Um, whether that's it with respect to a particular community, say indigenous communities, or with respect to ecosystems and, you know, ecosystems don't speak for themselves. They're abstractions as ecologists know, but nevertheless, there are things that, that, um, we know aren't working as well as we'd like them to be. Um, you know, we, you can't drink the water for certain reasons. You can't, um, there are things that we don't want to eat. We don't want to do because of what's been done. Um, if we want to have healthy ecosystems, we have to kind of figure out what we've, where we've gone wrong and try to kind of repair things working backwards in a sense. And there's a lot, you know, there's a huge conversation it has to do with changing the ways we farm, changing the ways we, 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 we live in our architecture, urban design. Um, that's not necessarily in that category of reparations, but there's a lot to be done. And uh, just to end on a more positive note, one of the things I, I often tell students is that there's so much to be done in every field of endeavor all you have to do is find something that you do well and that you enjoy doing that's in alignment with the transition that we need to be making as a society and do that. And if enough people do that, then there, there's hope. It's a great lead in, I think, to the, the closing 
uh, question and, and comment is that there, you know, there is so much to be done, uh, even within the arts and humanities, right? That mm -hmm. we often think of climate change as a problem for scientists uh, to solve, but there's a lot for cultural workers to do. Uh, and the question that's in the, the chat um, is, you know, can you tell us just a little bit more about the artist who created the underwater art um, and um, where we might learn more about them and others who are doing that kind of work that interacts with the natural environment? Sure. So that particular artist is Jason DeCare Taylor. He's a British sculptor who began uh, creating these sculptures uh, intended for to be deposited at the bottom of the ocean. Uh, I can't remember exactly when. He's been doing it for about 20 years. He has a website called underwatersculpture.com, I believe. If you just Google Taylor underwater sculpture, you'll come across a lot of stuff. He's pretty easy to find. Uh, there are many artists. It's, um, I, I teach a whole course, and this could be a whole separate talk on artists who have been doing various kinds of art, either in the, the vein of uh, art that doubles as ecological restoration or art that doubles as eco-cultural or cultural restoration, working with communities, dispossessed communities, communities traumatized, and working with them in ways uh, that on projects that help to heal both the cultural dislocation and to move in the direction of ecological uh, reparation, so to speak. Uh, so that's, you know, the, there's a lot to point to there. Pretty hard for me to wrap that up in a in a short answer. So hopefully I've at least whet the appetite for, for more of that kind of work. 